Good evening, everyone. I am James Wetzel. I am the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science, and I am thrilled to welcome you tonight to our virtual encore of Obscured Vision, a night of sonic storytelling. Tonight is a part of our virtual season of adult programming, which is a part of our MOS at Home initiative. We have turned the Museum of Science into a virtual museum, offering free STEM-related programming on a daily basis through our digital platforms. And as a part of that, we have launched our subspace adult programs after dark channel to host tonight's event and the rest of our upcoming virtual lineup. And we have some fantastic events and experiences still to come over the next couple of months, all free, all virtual and all for adult audiences like yourselves. So we hope you'll continue to come back and hang out with us after dark. Tonight we are here for an encore of a show we first premiered at the museum this past fall to a sold out audience. It is a collaboration with our friends, science reporter and producer Ari Daniel and sound designer Ian Koss. Together we have created an evening of storytelling that will showcase and highlight some incredible individuals and through Ian's lush sound design, hopefully create an immersive new way for us all to experience the power of sound and the spoken word. And I'm so thrilled that we have the chance to sort of um, share these wonderful stories with all of you one more time and to bring them into all of your homes this evening. While we are here tonight for this encore, I'm thrilled to say we are already hard at work on Obscured Vision show number two, which we hope to premiere a whole new lineup of stories with Ari and Ian at the museum sometime in our fall season. So more details on that still to come. And I will be back a little bit later on to moderate a Q&A with Ari and Ian. So if you do have questions tonight, you can submit those using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're watching on Zoom with us. And we will try and go through as many of those as we can a little bit later on. I need to thank our friends at the Lowell Institute for their continued support of the adult programming at the Museum of Science. Without them, we would not be here tonight and this would not be a free event. So please join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause to the Lowell Institute. And finally, if you do enjoy yourself tonight after the show, I ask you to go to mos.org slash science matters and show your support for the MOS at home initiative and allow us to keep bringing programming like this into your homes during this time of isolation. Once again, that's mos.org slash science matters. But now it is my pleasure to bring and introduce into the Zoom your hosts for this evening, Ari Daniel and Ian Koss. Good evening and welcome. Hey there, everybody. It's so nice to have you with us. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday evening. We are so excited to be sharing with you tonight four different stories. And the goal of this is for us to try to transport you into four very different worlds. Um, now, before we get started, we want to make sure that you take care of yourselves tonight. The content of a particular story or the immersive nature of this experience may mean that you'll want to take your headphones off or take a moment to stretch, um, which is fine. You should do that. And you can even wait for a story to conclude before tuning back in. And you can just um, see that when Ian and I come back on the screen, because we will go invisible during the playing of the story. Once we're back on the screen, you can um, put your headphones back on and resume the show with us. And we, would, we thought we would start by jumping right into our first story tonight. Um, in between each of these stories, Ian and I are going to come back to kind of um, do a little bit of digestion of the story and, uh, and reflection on it. Great. All right. So I think we're all set to get started. I'm just um, I'm finishing up my face mask here. Um, I need just another second, although maybe I'll, um, I'll just finish with this. <laughs> all right. M I know we're all at home, so we're 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 getting you used to making. You got a lot of deals. options. Yes, um, we'll we'll figure something out. But the the important thing is, if you can, or if you so desire, now would be the time to cover up your eyes. Maybe not with an old sock, but with something else. Slip on a blindfold of some sort, and we'll see you again shortly after a story called "On Mirror." Okay, here we go. It was the first morning of my internal medicine rotation. Suddenly, out of nowhere, code blue alarm goes off. 
and the overhead announced that it was in a waiting room. It was real close to where we were. It's right around the corner. The supervising doctor's reflexes were immediate. Jumped out of her seat and like ran out the door. And me, the medical student, like was running up behind her. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be a part of this. I was actually kind of excited. Oh my gosh, my first group blue. Maybe I'll do some compressions. First cardiac arrest I get to see. And we walk into the waiting room. I see this man on the ground. And immediately, I feel the sensation of linoleum floor against my back. As they're doing compressions on his chest, I feel as though someone is doing compressions on my chest, feeling my chest buckling under each of the compressions. As they put a breathing tube into his throat, I feel the sharp sensation of some object just sliding down the back of my throat and as they're giving him breaths to ventilate his chest inflates and I feel my chest inflating and then hollowing out and after 30 minutes of this they they pronounce him dead at that moment I couldn't feel anything in my body I felt as though I I had died and had to just will myself um, to, to breathe. I went into the closest bathroom. I just went right to the toilet and threw up. Washed my face, looking at myself in the mirror, telling myself that this is, this is me, this is my body, that I, I hadn't, hadn't died. At the same time, I was just feeling so angry at myself because here I was supposed to be training to be this doctor um, who would be there for, for any kind of emergency, for any kind of a patient situation, and I could barely keep myself together. This is an extreme example, but versions and variations of this experience cascade through 35-year-old Joel Salinas every day wherever he goes. It's like channel surfing. Joel takes me outside on a walk to illustrate. My immediate impression as I'm walking out here is I see two women having a conversation. I feel the sensation of her purse on my right shoulder, kind of a heavy bag. Joel has a condition um, called synesthesia. Just think of it as a, a blending of the senses. One sense enters your brain, and it also gets interpreted or translated through another sense as well. So someone with synesthesia might hear the sound of a violin and also perceive the color violet. These kinds of synesthesia are somewhat common. For myself, when I see the word cat, you may have even heard of them before. Letter C will be black, letter A is red, T is red-orange. Joelle's synesthesia encompasses some of these elements, but there's clearly something else going on. He's got this other form of the condition that's very rare. It's called mirror touch, or mirror touch From synesthesia. Jacket on the shoulder to leaning forward with the bag, the earring tie, sharp like straw. Up on the <laughs> Essentially, seeing other people also activates touch portions in the brain. The bouncing, the pelvis is kind of a little bit. From the sensation. So, Seeing people move, experience pleasure, pain, or be touched, my brain is processing that and interpreting it as physical touch, physical sensation in my own body. And what's fascinating is that this is something that relates to how all of us experience the world. So this mirror system is something that we all have, and it's always going on below the surface, except every once in a while, this, this system may become so active that it crosses the threshold into consciousness. So if you're watching uh, someone playing football and they get suddenly tackled, or their knee gets like hyperextended all of a sudden, that cringe feeling that, that you get is believed to be partly due to this mirror system becoming very active, so you experience it as if it were happening to you. What makes kind of mirror touch unique is that that activity seems to be very, very active almost all of the time. 
So there's this mirroring system, and then there's this other system that's believed to be involved. So it's parts of the brain that distinguish your body from other people's physical body. So there's a kind of like a blurring of the boundary between where I begin and you end and you end and I begin. That's why the cardiac arrest code blue episode was so debilitating. The more I focus on the sensations not in my body, the harder it is to get back to my own sensations. Joel gave in to the experience of that man, and the deeper he submerged himself, the more he got pulled inside that other body, and the harder it was for him to come back. Around that time, things took a bad turn for Joel. I just like woke up one morning and I was having like a lot of head pain right over the right kind of top part of my skull. As I would feel over that, I'm feeling like an indentation kind of in my skull, which is weird and I hadn't noticed it before. And as I push hard on that section, there's also a lot, a lot more pain. At this clinic that Joel was working at as a med student, he found himself beside a world-renowned neurosurgeon. Oh, so I was just wondering, like, what what does it mean if you suddenly develop a headache one day? Yeah, just for a friend. And he looks at me down the rim of his glasses and he says, usually means you're going to die. I was like, oh, okay. Well, (laughs) I think I might have that. so after, after reassuring me a little bit, he um, made sure that back at my medical school, they took me through all sorts of tests and CAT scans and MRIs and, and other things to figure out what was going on. And they discovered I had a tumor and that was eating away a lot of the bone around my skull and it was right over my brain. So they decided to open up that part of my head and scrape off a piece, figure out whether it's benign or malignant, and then if it looked like it was benign, like remove the whole thing. I remember being kind of concerned about it and wondering after that is removed, like what will happen to me? Will my brain change? And if my brain changes, does my mind change? And if my mind changes, does my synesthesia change? And if my synesthesia changes, do I as a person who I am right now, does that change too? And so I ended up going to neurosurgery for it. The next thing I remember is just kind of like coming back into existence. And my immediate thought was, let me look for writing because I want to see if I still have my synesthesia. And I saw this sign um, the colors were there and I was so relieved. My P was still purple, my A was red, my C was black, my U was yellow, thank God. Uh, And I had just, it was like such a relief to realize that I I still had this like part of me. It was later that Joel was told what had been blooming inside his head. There was this, this mass that was pulsating in that area, slightly smaller than a golf ball. They described it as a benign angiofibroma, which is just kind of like a tangle of blood vessels and weird cells. If it hadn't been removed, it would have kept on growing and eating away at the bone of my skull. It looked like it was something that had been there since I was born. Uh, as, as I grew up, the tumor grew up um, and was probably affecting how my brain was developing. And as it turns out, there's a big role to this part of the brain called the right temporoparietal junction, which is an area where all the different senses kind of converge and that was the area that the tumor was over. So Joel may have been right. This snarl of vessels and cells may well have gifted him his synesthetic abilities, but its removal didn't alter or diminish those gifts. Actually, it was shortly after the excision of the angiofibroma that Joel had that vicarious cardiac arrest. Here I was supposed to be training to be this doctor who would be there for any kind of a patient situation and I could barely keep myself together. And he realized he needed a way to keep his mirror touch in check, to keep his mind inside his own skull. 
But a remarkable thing happened as Joel went on to become a neurologist, and he explored that blurry boundary at the edge of himself. He discovered he doesn't always have to shield himself from others. Because sometimes, when he leans into the mirror, reaches across it, he connects with people in the most extraordinary of ways. So I had this one patient who had nearly escaped a stroke. When I was seeing him in, in the clinic, he, his cholesterol was down, the measure of diabetes was gone down by quite a bit, and I was congratulating him. Now this was He had just won this Olympic gold medal in health. And he was just smiling to the congratulations. The physical sensations I felt in my body didn't feel consistent with the joy and gratitude that I'd felt in other people before. And that cued me into asking a, a follow-up question. How are you actually feeling? And he broke down crying. It turned out that he had been just so tortured by the thought of having another stroke that he was just a nervous wreck. And that question, that moment, allowed us to talk about it and then put, put together a plan around it. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't kind of taken a chance and ask one more question from this weird sensation that I had in my brain. I mean, it's, it comes kind of automatically for me, but I think that's true for anybody. If you just take a moment to just imagine as vividly as you can what it must be like to physically feel what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes, you might find yourself connecting with someone that you couldn't have connected to before. I'm wondering, do you regard this as a gift? Do you regard it as a burden? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering what your relationship is with this part of yourself. Just like everybody else, I'm still figuring out how to exist in my bag of bones <laughs> with this weird perky brain that I appeared in this world with. Mirror touch for me, I mean, it just is. It's just part of who I am, part of what makes me, me. So if anything, I would say that it's, sometimes it's a gift, sometimes it's a curse, but all the time it's a world. So take a moment to come back. And uh, while you're reacclimating to the ambient lighting, um, just a reminder in terms of the Q&A that's going to follow this program, that you can submit your question via the Q&A option in Zoom instead of raising your hand since the chat's disabled. And your questions will go directly to the moderators of the show. Um, so. Uh, Ian and I are going to talk a little bit after each of the stories. Um, and, you know, to start this one off, I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, my role just in a sentence. And that was to basically conduct the interviews and then to piece together the kind of narrative structure of the story that sometimes involved a little bit of scripting where my voice would come in. But I essentially arranged a much longer interview into uh, more or less the, the ordering that you heard here. Um, Ian's going to share a little bit about his process in a second. Um, but, you know, this, this story um, uh, was uh, kind of emerged uh, from Joel Salinas. He has a book called Mirror Touch. He actually spoke at the Museum of Science um, uh, at some point. And so the museum suggested that we reach out to him because he might have a, have a good story to tell for this show. So I did that, and I, I, but before doing that, I, I read his book. And um, uh, it starts with, I betray myself. During my first week as an internal medicine clerk, I was going through my patient list with the attending on duty when a code blue was called in the waiting room. Before the announcement on the overhead system finished ringing out, the attending and I were already bolting out the door. So it starts in the same way that this, um, this audio story started. And... I knew that's how I wanted to begin this piece because it's so arresting. 
And Joelle actually attended the show that we did in the fall that was in person and live. And afterwards, he came up to me and Ian, and he said he was so struck by how accurately the sound of the that opening scene captured his experience. He felt like he was reliving it. Um, and that really is due to the beautiful work of Ian, who has done the sound design and composition for these stories. So uh, Ian, I, I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your process and how you got that so right. Yeah, well, so as, as Ari mentioned, you know, what I got was basically a long monologue. And I think my goal is to take what feels like a monologue, what feels like a person talking and add little touches that make it feel like a world, like an experience, make it feel three dimensional. Um, and sometimes it's just little things. Um, but part of what I find so um, exciting and fun about that process of sound design is that it's a mixture of very literal touches. You know, for example, we're in the hospital, we hear, you know, the stretcher go by, we hear the code blue alarm. There are these uh, literal references that give you a sense of place, but actually a lot of what you're hearing in the sound design is more abstract. Um, so when you hear the chest compressions, it's not actually the sound of somebody giving chest compressions. When he talks about um, having a respirator um, put in somebody's throat, it's not, um, it, it's, you're not actually hearing the sound of those things. Um, what you're hearing is abstract sound, which can sort of blend together with the literal. And for me, that's, that's what's so fun about it is it's um, that line between what's, what's music, what's sound effects, um, it all kind of breaks down and just becomes, ideally at least, a world of sound. Um, so you, and that's so that exactly mixing what of the, that mixing of the literal and the abstract for you, Ian, um, creates a fuller reality than mm -hmm. either might create on their own? I think so, yeah. And, and for me, it's part of what's um, distinct about audio storytelling. When you watch a film, it's the sound design is much more literal because it's in reference to an image, right? So, you know, the, what you're hearing tends to match what you're seeing, seeing in a literal way. But because when we're experiencing the story in sound, we're creating our own picture in our mind. And so the sounds don't, they're not constrained by any kind of visual reference point you know um, and so even a, an abstract touch like a, a whooshing sound or a buzzing sound or a ch jittery sound can um, can become can feel like it's part of a scene even if we know it's not the actual sound of that thing so um, this next story well maybe you can listen with that in mind um, and I really want to encourage you again, you know, we said this at the top of the show, um, but it's, you know, when we're not together physically in person, we can't dim the lights like we would in the theater. Um, we're probably all at a computer or device, but I do want to encourage you to get in a really comfortable place where you can not see, not look at the screen, not look at any screen, ideally. Um, maybe you're lying down, maybe you're in your favorite chair, but find your comfortable place. Um, slip on your blindfold, turn out the lights, uh, because we're going into a second story. This one is very different, um, but similar in a way in that it's taking us inside the experience of somebody who senses and perceives the world in a really unique way. Her name is Vicki Monroe, and this is her story on message. <laughs> I was staying in a castle in Frankfurt, Germany. Actually, this was during the winter. And at that time of year, there was the Christmas markets and all that going on. So lots of lights, very festive. The castle itself was small. It was owned by a countess and a count and basically vacant. The count and the countess do not stay there. But it sat up on a hill and it was actually, there was not a lot of activity around there and it was surrounded by um, very tall pine trees. Big oak door. 
You know, you had the old skeleton key. First actual step into the castle was when it was dark. It was probably 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, God, nobody left the light on? There's a long, long hallway where there are portraits of different family members. There were tapestries on some of the walls. And at the end of that hallway, there's a grand piano. When I walked in, there was a, a very tall gentleman with a top hat playing a piano. He had sideburns that, that turned into like a mustache that went over his lip. His eyes were closed. It was just he was enjoying the moment. I listened for a few minutes and I thought, oh, maybe I'm not by myself. Maybe there's other people here. And I stepped on a board on the floor and it creaked and he looked up and he disappeared. He faded enough so that, I, I swear, enough so I could see the expression on his face was not pleasant at all. And he was gone. Now I'm a little nervous. So at that point, I started to walk up this beautiful grand staircase. And at the first landing was a little boy, not in modern day clothing, I noticed right away. White socks that came up to his knees and, you know, a white button down sweater. He had this red ball that he was bouncing. And he just looked like a little brat. He really did. He just looked like a little obnoxious three-year-old. because I ignored him, he throws the ball at each step behind me, just below my foot, as I'm going up the stairs. I made it to the top landing, and there was a very pretty lady standing at the top, and I thought, oh, somebody that I might know here, a friend. And then I noticed her clothes, 1700s French look style dress. She just looked at me, and she was very annoyed. She had her arms crossed, and she was tapping her foot. I could tell she wanted to walk into the room with me, but she didn't. I closed the door and I waited. When I opened the door back, she was gone. I left the light on that night. I never do that. And I continued to hear knocking on the door, footsteps going up and down the stairwell. You hear that ball bouncing. I heard her foot tapping. I didn't sleep really well. The next morning, I went down, and everything looked so nice in the daytime. And the countess was downstairs, and I said, you know, I thought I was the only one here last night. And she said, well, you are. And I said, no, there were three people here last night. I can assure you. And I told her about the gentleman at the piano, the little boy. And then I explained about the woman at the top of the stairs. And she said, come with me. And so we went into the, her office and it showed portraits. Her grandfather was a little boy. The woman was the great grandmother and the great grandfather. And they were all on the wall. And she says, and these were them. And I said, yes. And she says, and this is why we don't stay here. Because she was too startled by it. And it, it scares her. But it didn't scare Vicki Monroe. Ghosts are kind of her thing. She's a spirit messenger. A spirit messenger is somebody that communicates with those on the other side, delivering messages to those that are alive. Like a medium, um, but I think more uh, personal. I'll go to the person that's alive, who they want to speak to, and give them the information that I'm getting from their deceased loved one. Word for word. That's what I do. This is Vicki Monroe with Spirit Messenger. It's an easily judged job that I have. My name is Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Jackie, has your mother and father passed? Uh, yes. There are just some people that are going to believe what they want to believe. And I always tell them at the very beginning, the choice is yours. You know, what you believe in the end, that's up to you. This is probably my third time seeing her, and I've actually... I feel like every time I read somebody, I'm bringing validation to one more person. 
talk to my father. But again, it's not to prove it. I have nothing to prove to anybody. You either believe it or you don't. Here's what persuades some people. Portland, Maine. A peaceful city in historic New England. A case from 2001 featured on the television show Psychic Investigators. Amy St. Laurent, a 25-year-old administrative assistant and Portland native, disappears into the night. The lead detective at the Portland Police Department had called me. And he said, have you heard about this missing young woman? It had been a week, I think, since she'd gone missing. And he said, we've run dry on this. We do not know where she is. He said, I'd like for her mother to come see you and bring her picture. And so she came over, and of course she was devastated, and she gave me a a picture of her daughter. I had a clock up there, and everybody always seemed to come through the clock. And then her daughter stepped right through the clock, and I knew then that she was deceased. I was telling her mother that, and she says, where is she? I said, you know, I don't know where she is. She's not saying anything. She's just letting you know everything will be all right. The case will be closed. The detective called me the next day. While I was on the phone with him, Amy showed up in my house. And I told him, well, she's right here. He goes, what is she wearing? And I said, well, she has a yellow sweatshirt on. He said, do you see where she was the night that she went disappearing? And I said, yeah, it looks like she was at a club. But she left. And there's another man. And I said, I, and I keep hearing the name Jeff. She's saying Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. And then she showed me this long road with this. It's, it's actually a, a landmark. A, it's called Smiling Hill Farm. And I saw that and I said, Detective Lachlan, she's showing me Smiling Hill Farm. There should be tire tracks going into this place. She's showing me a house. I told him she's between this house and there's a logging trail that she's up. But I said, she's telling me it's so important. You need to go there soon before the first snowfall. And he said, well, we're going to go today. We're going to go see if we can find it. He called me, and he said, we found her. And he said, I want to let you know, Jeff Gorman is the man that we just apprehended. He's the one that took her for the ride. His house is the one that you were talking about. And he picked her up, and he hit her with a shovel and buried her outside of his mother's house. And that's, that was the case. Vicki says she gets along with most spirits. Normally, when I go into a home or something... I'm immediately communicating with the spirit that's there. It's a happy situation, and it's <laughs> it goes well because they're like, oh, she's here. She's going to deliver the messages. But at that castle in Frankfurt, everything was different. I've never walked into a place and felt cold before where y- you feel a sense of other spirits might love you. I'm not sure we do. And they visited every night that I was there, knocking on my door and moving my things. And the other thing, too, was they didn't speak to me the way other spirits do. With these three, it was I would hear them in my head rather than them talking to me. And that was different for me. And that freaked me out, I will say, a little bit more. But Vicki pressed on. She was in Frankfurt for a reason, to do her work. She set up shop in the castle. People would come during the day, and I would communicate with their loved ones. And gradually, over the course of a week, Vicki noticed something shift for those three unwelcoming spirits. They're watching me every day bring comfort to these other people that are, are living, and they're seeing other spirits in their home, welcoming and happy to see their loved ones that are still alive. And I feel like that in itself was, okay, so she's doing a service for us here that live on the other side and for those that we love. And I had to really work to show them that my job is to connect these two worlds together. 
I'm here to help. And that is it. But this particular instance made me much more respectful that there are all different types of people when we're alive, and there are different types of souls out there too. These were not evil spirits. They were just different than the spirits that I had met before. They had a much stronger connection to the land that they lived on and the building that they resided in. And I needed to be respectful of that and say, okay, this is your house. Thank you for letting me be here. I get it. I understand. So it sounds like they taught you some humility. Absolutely. Which I didn't realize I needed, but in the end, I did need it. Yeah. And the more you open your mind to things, the more things you will experience. And you should embrace that and not fear it. That's what I learned in the castle. Hey everyone, you can come back with us now. So Ari, coming out of that story about Vicky and the castle and the spirits, I just, um, I guess I just wanna pose what to me is sort of the obvious question and maybe some of you are wondering it as well, but we are here uh, at this virtual event for the Museum of Science. Um, why, why did you wanna include a ghost story? in this series and what, or what place does it have in this series for you that's important? Well, I should say that it was actually the Museum of Science that approached us with this story. Um, uh, you know, the, the adult programming uh, wants to be more about, uh, more than just science. They do a lot of science programming, but they also do just a really wide range. Um, so um, they were excited about including something that was a little bit um, unexpected in the lineup. Um, now, I work as a science reporter and a science producer. Uh, so, you know, when I read Joel's book and I interviewed him, I believed everything he said. That's like uh, right up your alley. Yeah. Bread and yeah. butter. That's right. That's right. Okay. I'm like, I'm into the ganglia. Uh, <laughs> but I was skeptical when the museum came to me about Vicky's story. I, I, I wasn't sure what to think, even after I interviewed her. But, you know, it kind of got me thinking about why I would believe one story and not another even though they both rely on perception of somebody else mm -hmm. and neither can actually be verified by me. So, you know, in thinking about this, um, I, I kind of came to realize that there are two faces of the same coin. They're both stories about uh, people who have perceptions of the world around them that directly contradict my own experience. I have no way to confirm or deny either except to trust what they tell me. And yet I'm more inclined, uh, you know, at least at first I was more inclined to believe Joelle than I was to believe Vicky uh, because Joelle's got medical charts and data mm. that can back up his claims. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm still um, a little unsure of Vicky's abilities, but her story, especially the part where she explained to me how she helped solve that murder case, which she did do. Yeah. You really, wanted evidence. I did, and she gave it to me. Um, you know, really challenged my sense of fact versus fiction. Hmm. So, as of today, you're unsure, open, open. I mean, I you know when I I love how you put this, how you added the sound elements and the music, Ian and. When I, every time I listen to it, I'm transported directly into that castle. And in some ways, you know, there's a part of storytelling, you know, certainly if I'm telling a science story, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I want to verify everything. But there's a lot of art to what we're doing tonight. And mm -hmm. a big part of just storytelling in general yeah. is feeling transported into a, yeah. into a different place. And I, and I think, right. you know, your work on this story certainly helped achieve that for me. It's fun to take off the journalistic hat sometimes and say, this is their story and it's whatever they say it is. And we're going to create that world and not worry about fact checking the, the facts that cannot be checked and just tell the story. That's right. 
That's right. So let's dive into our third story for this evening, uh, which is uh, a bit different than the first two. It's not about just one person's experience. It's the story of a whole family. Um, so please uh, put your blindfolds back on or shut out the lights um, and, uh, and get ready to listen to our third story this evening, which is called On Murmur. When I was little, I used to want to have 12 kids. I did not want to have that many kids. And I would write a list of names for each one of my children to have. I'm Ashley Smart. My name is Crystal Smart. When we got married, maybe within the first two years, we had Emery, yeah. uh -huh. our oldest son. And then... I think the month before Emery's first birthday, I ended up pregnant with Ellison. During the ultrasound, they kind of were spending a long time around my belly. And I was like, yeah, what's happening? But eventually, the doctor said it was like an ASD, VSD issue. Basically, two holes in his heart that are sometimes an indicator of Down syndrome. And so they encouraged us to do DNA testing to find out for sure. The doctor called back and he just said that the testing showed that there's a 99% chance that your child has Down syndrome. I'm just like in shock, don't know what that means. Let me call Ashley and he's quiet. I felt like I didn't have the tools really to process that information. I didn't know enough about Down syndrome and I didn't know, maybe it's like I didn't know enough about ourselves because I really doubted our ability to handle it and still have a happy life. I think we hung up, and I just start oh, weeping, weeping, weeping. People would say, congratulations, and I'm thinking, why would they say congratulations? I just felt like, you don't even know what's going on, and you don't know what my child is going to be like. I didn't know if I was up to the task as a dad, if I could be strong enough to advocate for him. I didn't know if I had it in me, to be honest. Would I let him down? You know? But when he got here... He's so cute, oh my gosh! It's like all that stuff just went away. But I remember hearing the great things. Your boy is perfect. And so I just felt like, yes, this is a great thing. And yes, this is my son and I love him. And basically from that point, he was just our son and, and love and joy. You know, for that first year, he was just a cute little baby, you know. And our, our friends that had kids that were the same age, they were, they were cute little babies too. It was just, they were all just cute little babies. But around a year or so, you know, that's when you start to notice, okay, our other friends, kids, you know, they're, they're talking, they're walking around and becoming little toddlers. And Ellison is still, you know, the cute little baby. Ellison, are you gonna talk to the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> like many kids with Down syndrome, he has language delays, but he also, on top of that, has hearing loss. I guess it's like a 40% hearing loss or something. It's mild hearing loss. What did you do today? And so we really struggled trying to get him to talk. <laughs> it was such a contrast to his older brother who just naturally pick up stuff and, and you know, repeat the things class, that he said. Ellison, that one-year-old, wasn't speaking. I did start to think like, oh, is he going to be nonverbal? Literally worried that he might never, never speak.
I think early on, people encouraged us to explore sign language. Physically, it's easier to make hand expressions than to articulate words. He just started picking stuff up. A little sign for, what was first? Maybe the sign for milk was first. Yeah, you squeeze your hands together like you're milking a cow. There's daddy, which is putting your open hand with the thumb to the forehead, or mommy doing the same thing with the thumb to the chin. You could sit in front of him and talk to him all day, and he would just look back at you. <laughs> but if you sit in front of him and start doing signs, he'd, he'd start doing them back to you. Bunny rabbits and... Duck, frog. He was just picking up words left and right. He was learning some signs that even I had trouble <laughs> like learning. So he knew more signs than we did, and probably still does. As he's doing more and more signs, he just develops this demeanor that's very expressive because he's always talking with his hands. Allison, did you have fun at Allison, did you have fun at school? Yes or no? He also had music therapy and that I think really helps advance his language. You wanna do ashes, Allison? So the first song that Ellison really got excited about to me was yeah, let's do ashes, ashes as he calls it. Because he likes to see us all fall ashes, down. Ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> it's the movement and the singing that just gets words and sounds out of him. We all jump up. Say hello. hello. My name is Ellison. Well, he Ellison. said Dada first. And one day you just hear him say, Thank you. Ellison. Once you know that you're being heard, that's a powerful moment. Ellison, do you want some Play Doh? Yes. Play? yes. Put it in yeah. my ball. And for him, every time I see him recognizing that. He's asking for something or that's an airplane. He wants to tell you something. I try to give him as much attention as possible. And it doesn't always happen because we're parents, we get busy. But I try to say, what, what do you want to tell me or something? Because I want him to know that I'm hearing what you're telling me. One thing we should probably clarify is that when we talk about where he's at today, like he's still not talking a lot. He's thinking about a lot more than he's able to express. Crystal can always understand him. I can understand him most of the time, but often like a stranger might not understand him. So he's still got a really long way to go. It's still like, is he gonna be able to fully communicate his needs or what happened to him at school when we weren't around? I think that's the scariest thing is, is just the unknown of what he's feeling. My hope is that he'll have, you know, big, important ideas just like anyone else, right? Just like his brother would, just like his mom and dad <laughs> do, right? And I'm almost certain that he will, but I just hope that he'll be able to express it, you know, to be able to share them with the world. What, what a shame it would be if he had these great ideas, but no one could hear them. What is the world missing out on if, if we can't hear from him, you know? Open it. Open it. Sometimes we are truly lucky in a different way. Our eyes have been open to a whole nother world. Who is color? And it's just so fun to see him 
be proud of himself. You know, I feel proud of him being proud of himself. I wish we could all be proud of ourselves the way that he is proud of, of himself, you know. He'll come out, you know, his chest like puffed out big and yeah, high five. He'll ask for the high five. Sometimes he just looks at me and goes Mwah, and gives me kisses. And it's just the sweetest thing ever. And he wakes up every morning, and gives me hugs that the best hugs. So I think he just has, yeah, made our lives more exciting and rich and, and full. <laughs> the good and the bad and all of that. Nice one. Hey there. You can come on back. We've got um, just one more story for you tonight. Um, before we listen, sorry, I'm feeling, I always feel a little dazed when I come back <laughs> after listening to a story. Um, so before we listen to our last story, I think um, I just want to say, or we want to say that what, you're one of the reasons we were really committed to doing this show virtually, regardless of the circumstances, um, is that we felt that this type of storytelling, um, this type of connection with the experiences of others is so valuable to us as humans, so essential to us as humans. And I think especially so now in this moment where I think all of us are, are probably in some way or another, you know, looking for some kind of human connection or missing some kind of human connection in our lives. Um, and so this is just a, a small offering, um, a small effort to, to bring characters into your life and bring your life into other worlds and characters that um, you wouldn't experience otherwise, um, so that we can all be together right now in this moment. I like that word offering, Ian, because, you know, I, I, I think about when any time that someone opens up to me, so whether that was, um, you know, uh, Vicky or Joelle or Ashley, you know, and Crystal and, and the stories that we've heard, uh, Ellison, um, you know, anytime someone opens up and speaks into my microphone and mm. shares their story with me, I'm reminded that every story is a gift and that a story is a kind of sacred object, mm. one that should be treated thoughtfully and respectfully and often reverentially. Mm. Uh, which is certainly the case for our final story this evening. It's a story that I feel so honored that we have the chance to share with you. Um, so for the last time tonight, uh, before our Q&A at the end, we'd love for you to put your blindfolds back on and to meet Shireen Fonz for our last story, which is entitled On Muscle. <laughs> It started out with the most basic of things, like this this, this one guy emailed me, uh, ha hounded me until the cows came home. I will pay $400 for me to wear any short skirt in heels. in heels. So you're saying that all I have to do is put on a nice skirt with some heels and you're paying $400? Yes. Okay, that sounds sketchy, right? So here I am and I'm making $400 just to wear a skirt. That was the one incident that sprung open my eyes to a world I didn't even know. Ex I mean, I might have known has existed, but I, I didn't know that there was something out there to explore where women with muscle was concerned. I mean, I walk around at five foot five at about 190 pounds, and that is very lean. My entire upper body is tatted, very low body fat, very athletic, very highly conditioned. I might have gone a little overboard. <laughs> very heavy muscle. <laughs> 
it wasn't only happening at work, it was happening everywhere. $400. People were noticing me and making me weird, bizarre offers on the side. $350. I would get bizarre emails. Just one thing. And it was all had a very common theme. The muscles. People were fascinated with the muscle. $500. So I'm like, okay. Let's do this. So I sought out and trained under an OWK mistress, the other world kingdom, and I found my own niche eventually, which basically ended up being all fetishes that deal with female muscle. I became a professional dominatrix. I get a lot of corporal punishment requests, which would involve heavy flogging, a variety of whips, uh, nipple clamps, or chastity devices of various sorts. I do a lot of heavy breath play as well and sensory deprivation. And a very wide range of wrestling services, light fantasy Full style, no hold requirement. Work. People who sought me out basically sought out the services of a very strong, commanding, authoritative, feminine presence. Shireen Fonz's journey towards this line of work started way before that $400 offer. It began where she grew up, in Lebanon. I am the eldest of three children. I have twin brothers. We were very well off because my father was a Middle East Airlines uh, captain. I know Shireen from school. You know, and I literally go back to kindergarten. My name is Renoa Schweiter. Pretty sure we were toddlers together. We both went to a private school in the suburbs of Beirut. My entire childhood, we were very good friends. We were probably five when we first met. We were just nerdy and simple. We never really wore makeup. We never really did our hair. We were just very close, and and she wrote very beautifully. She was very passionate about her friends and her friendships, being vocal against someone who would hurt her friends. Honestly, like looking back at pictures, I don't see it, but I do remember that she thought she was chubby. Now, Renoa likes to say that wasn't the case, but I'm telling you, when we had our first communion, they didn't have a dress that would fit me, so they had to actually custom make me one. Um, I was a bigger girl. She didn't bring a lot of food to school. Just to me, it did not look like enough food. I would go to school with a lunchbox that was limited to a few pieces of lettuce, carrots, and, a, and one little thing of yogurt. She barely ate the whole day. And, and I was starving to death half the time. Hard to forget. I had to diet my, my whole life. As part of my father's obsession with what a woman should look like, I was always shamed for the fact that I did not fit that mold that he preferred. I remember her dad was tall and big and had dark hair and a mustache. He just had a very strong presence. A couple times after I'd met him, I decided something was off. We would slaughter our own cattle and our own meat, basically. You know, you just have this weird feeling. And for some bizarre reason, he had a fascination for slitting the throat of the calf. And then we were forced to have to actually literally dunk our hands into the warm blood as it seeped out of the body of a dying animal. And, and it, th that was not optional, by the way. No, you had to be literally showering in the fresh blood that was gushing out of an animal. Shireen and her mom were both nervous, anxious around him. He was completely incapable of compassion or empathy or affection of any kind. We went clubbing once, our little group of girls and all our mothers were having coffee somewhere nearby. And her mom kept going in, checking in, being really angsty, like, you need to go home because of your dad, you need to go home.
after he would beat my mother and kick her out of the house and then get himself completely intoxicated. I had to fend for myself most nights while trying to fend him off of me. And um, obviously, you know, you know where that's going. Both of them were a bit, were scared of her dad. He was the textbook representation of the Middle Eastern chauvinist alpha male who believes that women are subservient to men. And so I was scared to death. I mean, I I grew up afraid of my own shadow. I was frightened to death of him ever finding out anything about me. He would not let me out of the house. But I was was there for his viewing pleasure. There were times when I was paranoid enough to think that he might be inside my thoughts. And nobody else could look at me. I wasn't allowed to have any kind of life that he would know what I was thinking. Definitely not allowed to talk. I just was worried about disappointing him. I made a painting one year that I had gifted to my grandmother. Cloudy skies with thundering horizons and and crashing waves against a beach. I've always liked painting that. It was very sudden my last year of school. Her dad just decided to move and he picked the furthest place he could have picked. And I had to finish my last year somewhere else. I I was very upset. And I remember making her this like card, but I had made it like a 3D card. And I remember like spending so much time to make it work perfect. But when I gave it to her, she was very distracted and I don't think she registered what I had given her. And I I realized that things had changed between us and she was just different. She was angry, she was swearing a lot. Uh, She had dyed her hair another color and she was just, you know, just really ticked off. She was not the same person, but I didn't ask her why. I do regret not telling her how much I cared about her and how much I missed her, and and I regret not offering to help, not asking if she was okay. I could sense something was wrong, but I just didn't know how to ask her. Then you fell out of touch. Yeah, after that, yes, we did. Shireen soldiered on. She finished high school. She went to college. Quite honestly, at that point, I was just going through the motions. I didn't have a home to go to 90% of the time, so I would sleep on campus. In her senior year of college, in Shireen's words, all hell had broken loose at home. Her mom and brothers had fled her father and gotten themselves to Atlanta, Georgia. I didn't didn't even go to my graduation. I took my last class, and then I was on the next flight to the United States. But it was only a matter of time, a couple months, before her dad found his way to the U.S. We've been running from him since the day I came into this world. To Atlanta. He got severely intoxicated, and then he literally, he gave my mother the biggest beating I had ever seen him give her, ever. I fluctuated between being scared half to death to being completely enraged at how he would hurt my mother like that. He would actually have the balls to do something like that in the United States. Well, surely enough, I guess that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. I snapped and I gave him a beating right back. Like it was the first time in my life that I had actually stepped up to my father and I gave him the biggest fucking beating. He sat there in a state of absolute shock at how I would be able to step up to him like that. He spent his entire life breaking us down. He thought I was a husk of a human being. You know, if he had sat down with himself and had any kind of coherent thought, he would have realized that I had a lot of, I had a lot of fire in me. He got on a first flight the next day out of the United States. I was just happy. I was exhilarated. I mean, this country has, it was a miracle. The fact that I was finally in a position where I could say, you know what, I am done, goodbye, and I could, I could walk away from that. <laughs> 
I couldn't walk away from that back there. I told my mom, hey, listen, you go back there. I'm done with you too. And my mother left my father. And she never, that was the last time she had ever spoken to him. September 13th, 2001. My entire life I've been trying to get my mother to get away from my father. I think the one thing that actually did it was the fact that I finally was able to walk away myself. My dad and I, we didn't speak again after that. There was a serious sense of loss in me. It was, it was beyond grieving. So uh, that manifested itself in a serious eating disorder. Shireen ate very little. She exercised obsessively. She turned to drugs. I had to pay the price very dearly for having not processed what I needed to process as a child so that I could survive. I had to delve so deep inside myself and find something that I didn't know was there to fight through just so that I could survive another day. Gradually, she pulled out of the tailspin. The not eating faded away. The drugs fell away. And Shireen found a different outlet for the battle she'd been waging against her body. I was very self-conscious about the fact that, uh, yeah, I do have big legs, so we need to do something so that the upper body matches the rest. So that's what fueled my passion for women's bodybuilding. It was a desire to be symmetrical, better proportioned, because I thought that it was somehow linked to my self-worth. And so I was seeking out professionals to help me look even better. And at some point, she was noticed by one of the best women's Olympic weightlifting coaches of all time. And he recruited me as a super heavyweight and I competed for him for several years. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life to be fully sponsored by someone who saw so much drive in, like he saw so much talent in me. Later, she got into women's powerlifting. Trained with another highly recognized world champion. Shireen set American and world records. She found her way into Brazilian jiu-jitsu, where she earned a black belt and became a world champion. There is a wisdom that comes with the discipline and the self-esteem it's helped me build. I will lift and I will train uh, for strength and aesthetics until the day I die and take my last breath because it is ingrained in who I've become as a woman today. And in the midst of this... So here I am, and I'm making $400 just to wear a skirt. She got that email offering her $400 to wear a skirt. The first proposition of many. People were fascinated with the muscle. When Shireen became a dominatrix, what began as a side hustle grew into something surprisingly profound. We are a sisterhood of women that provide a safe space for people with certain deviant tendencies that they are unable to express in a healthy fashion and they're unable to get actual medical treatment for. And so as dominatrices, we create a safe space for people like that so that they could use pain as a channel. It's a means of purging themselves of that darkness that they cannot come to terms with. I mean, some people need to cry to purge. Some people need a beating to purge. I might not have been able to have these discussions with my father, but I've had these discussions with many other men. How does this person leave and go home and still be relatively well-adjusted husbands and fathers and brothers? And the healing starts almost instantly when someone comes to terms with the source of their, of their pain so that you could help someone channel it. And as she helped heal client after client, human being after human being, something began to shift inside Shireen. I was not only delivering a service, but I was also helping myself heal. I learned how to channel my anger and my aggression and understand pain, how it manifests and where it comes from. I noticed that the way I handled certain situations had changed and the way I felt about, about certain people in my life had changed. A couple months ago, she sent me a text on WhatsApp. One of those people was Hunwa. I just, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I couldn't believe that she found me again. And honestly, not that she just found it, she wanted to talk with me. I couldn't believe that she finally was reaching out. She took me back to that place in time when I was the happiest. I, I hadn't lost a part of myself yet, you know? Just remember... <laughs> our childhood. 
Even though I thought a part of me had died, it really hadn't. And she reminded me that it was always there. I was always that. And that just really moves me. Just the fact that she's able to look at me and just see who I was and not who I've become. Maybe there was a part of me that really needed someone to see me for who I was because everything I'm doing right now is so that I could find my way back to that little girl that I was. Innocent, fragile, sensitive, loving, compassionate, affectionate, um, kind. All of these things that I, I put away for a very long time. So I want to find my way back to that girl that I was, and she showed me that she could still see that, that, that she's still there, that, that this girl that I know, that, that I thought I'd lost, is still there. I'm, I'm very glad I found her, or we found each other. <laughs> I just had to find me first. Welcome back. Thank you all so much for uh, staying with us through that final story. We're now going to open it up to a Q&A that I believe James from the museum is going to moderate for us. Yes, first of all, Ari and Ian, thank you so much for taking us on that journey. Uh, we have been receiving a lot of just great comments about how much they're loving the experience. So I just wanted to pass that along. Um, we do have some questions. If you have questions about the experience, you can still submit them. Just do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're watching on Zoom, and we'll go through those. So I think the first one is just to talk about, Ian, you mentioned it a little bit about um, uh, sort of translating this to a virtual experience, but someone asked, uh, Ron asked, when you presented this live at the museum, did we ask the audience to wear blindfolds? Putting one on really added to the experience. So can the two of you just kind of talk a little bit about what that experience was on site? Sure, Ari, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we did exactly that, Ron. We um, actually, James uh, had, um, a, a mask, I believe they were placed on everybody's seat. So as folks came in, they, they took their blindfold and then we offered instructions at the beginning as to how they should proceed. Um, and we did invite people to put the blindfolds on. We also dimmed the lights. There was emergency lighting on the stairwell, and I, um, but everything else was, was dark in the room. Mm -hmm. And that was intentional. Uh, you know, part of, I think the, the magic in terms of audio storytelling is that although the soundtrack is the same for everybody, we each have our own imaginations and we populate that soundtrack very differently. Right. And we found that by shutting out sight, it just kind of enhanced that imaginative capacity. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll say for myself, when uh, we first started planning this program, I honestly thought the blindfold was a bit of a gimmick. Um, and then when we tried it, it it's a it's a small thing, but it really does um, put you into the world of the story in a different way. Um, so yeah, it, it is it's quite effective. You thought it was a gimmick until you started knitting one yourself. <laughs> yes, yes, and now now I, I knit blindfolds constantly in all my spare time. Great. Our next our next question comes from Judith. Um, how do you find your storytellers? So I guess maybe Ari specific mm. to this, this program, but also some of the other storytelling events that you do as well. Yeah, sure. So they, they kind of come from uh, all corners, you know. Um, uh, I think the, the Kitchen Sisters, a, a radio team, talk about that you find stories under every stone mm. and you, you, you turn over. And, and that's, that's true. I mean, there are stories that are like bundled inside each of us. And so, um, you know, I, I think it, it, it's, I, I often have sort of just like a, a radar sweep that's on where I'm just kind of constantly on the lookout for stories that I'll flag and sometimes I'll know immediately where to place them. Other times it takes me a little while to figure out exactly the right, um, the right place for it. Um, but uh, sometimes folks will come up and, and, you know, offer up a story because they know that I, I am, I trade and that sort of thing. Um, in, the, in the case of this show, as I mentioned, the museum approached us with, with both the story of uh, Joelle and of Vicky. Do um, you want to share how Shireen's story came to be part of the show? Yeah, yeah. So Renoir, in that fourth story, she's my wife. And uh, Shireen, as, you, as I as, as explained in the story, is a, is a close friend of hers from growing up. And uh, a few months before the show was when Shireen and Renoir 
re resumed contact with each other and Shireen came to our home and, uh, and I met her and I had a sense that she had a powerful story to tell. So with Hanma's permission, I approached Shireen to ask her about it and Shireen graciously opened up her heart and, uh, and shared that with me. So, um, and then Hanma also graciously opened up hers to share her, her side of the story. So, um, so that, that came through kind of a, a personal connection, but, uh, but really, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, from, from all places. Great. And Ian, we have a couple of questions about your process, sure. um, specifically about your use of music. So first of all, Paula said, this is beautiful. Ian, I'm curious to know how you decide when to add music and when not to use it. And then Sheldon mm. asked specifically, how did you decide or use it for that final dominatrix story? Oh, interesting. Um, well, just all, all the music you heard was composed and created for this show. Um, so this is all, you know, original music. Um, and that the question about how to know when to use it is a great, great question that I think about all the time. Um, for me, actually, I saw one of the questions is a student of mine, I recently taught a class about how to score podcasts at our, uh, one of our local treasures, the podcast garage. I saw one of um, our students was uh, in the group tonight. And um, something that I spend a lot of time, as I said, thinking and talking about is, um, knowing when to bring music in and when to bring music out um, because you don't necessarily want wall-to-wall -wall music the whole time um, because like any effect if used um, consistently and without uh, any kind of break it starts to lose its effect it just starts to we get used to it immune to it almost and so for me in order for music to be effective it has to be a little bit unpredictable um, it has to, sometimes there shouldn't be music for a while. Um, sometimes there'll be a short pause between music, um, between music sections. Um, but it's all about uh, working the music into the pacing of the story so that it's um, both, you know, accentuating the moments that need to be accentuating, but also, um, you know, playing with your expectations a little bit so it doesn't become too predictable. Um, so that's, I realize that's not a, a sim simple recipe. But also, but, uh, Ian, I feel like you use the, the moments without sound to create effect too. You know, sometimes yes. when, the, when the sound just bottoms out, that's right. another way to add emphasis, even though it has no scoring underneath it. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, for me, one of the most powerful effects is taking music away. Um, and so really, sometimes almost what I do, you know, when I start out with a story like this it's you know like Shireen's story is 20 minutes long you know I'm creating a bit of a mental schema from the start you know a, a map of okay here's a climax we have to work towards this um, so either we're it's a slow build up to that or maybe there's something you know that's been going on for a long time and it's going to cut out right there um, but you almost have to work backwards um, or forwards from those those key nodes. You find the moments where okay, this is this is the moment we want to emphasize, and and then decide okay, that's the moment where the music's going to enter, or maybe the music's going to exit, um, and you just you you plan it around that. So it, it, I mean, I guess it's some combination of intuition and and trying to sort of almost think strategically about you know when is the music going to serve the story best. Wonderful. And on that note, a follow-up is, were one of these stories more difficult or did any of them have any unique challenges that the others didn't for your design process? Um, interesting. I think uh, Shireen's story, so the first two stories um, were, I don't want to say easier, but they had a very clear um, almost sort of like visual and sonic um, narratives and references as we went through them, like the ghost story, you know, Vicky, she just handed it to us, you know, the bouncing ball, the man playing the piano, the wind, the skeleton key, like she's literally narrating the sounds in the story. Um, and so a lot of the process of that one was just, okay, I 
go bounce a ball somewhere and record it, um, find an old piano and play it. Um, Shireen's story was interesting because the drama of it, the, the tension, what makes it uh, such a riveting story is much more internal um, and uh, internal and at the same time deeply personal um, in often dark ways, right? And so it's, there's a, in sound design, sometimes we say when, when the sound is too kind of literal and on the nose, it's almost like Mickey Mousing, you know, it's like Mickey Mouse goes up the steps. It's like blink, 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 blink. Um, and you don't, you know, when the, when, the, when the story is one like Shireen's that's so intensely personal and so internal, that kind of, uh, you don't want to Mickey Mouse it, right? You don't want to try and dress it up with, you know, like she's talking about bathing her hands in blood and all you hear is like gushing, right? Um, so it's, it's a much more, that one in particular was um, a kind of a delicate story to handle because of the emotional weight and content of it. Um, but also the palette was much more, um, I don't wanna say blank, but it was abstract. It, would, it left a lot of room for molding. And so a lot of the sound, there was, we found some ways to incorporate kind of more literal sound design. Like we created the sound, like I recorded myself reading her emails and um, I, you know, it's like some keyboard typing and different uh, sound effects like that. But then a lot of, you know, the, the sound design is more in the abstract realm of, of music textures that hopefully kind of signpost and, and sculpt the story without, like I said, kind of like literally hitting every beat. So challenging, but also rewarding by the same token. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Ari, were there any parts of your conversations or interviews that didn't make it into the final cut of the stories that you found, but maybe didn't fit in with the overarching narrative or, or storyline you were, you were trying to, to tell? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, Yes, yes. You know, I, I think it's, it's some of it, so, when, when reviewing, you know, when I do an interview, I, especially for this type of show, you know, the, the, it's really in depth. I mean, every interview lasted at least an hour, you know, and of course we, we need to winnow that down. And, and sometimes that's, that's, uh, that's simple, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, kind of like making a soup, you know, it's like you're cutting off the tops of the carrots or the, the peels or something, you know, that's going to go. But then there's this kind of, long period of a low simmer where you're like mm. boiling off a lot of the, mm. the water and letting the flavors mingle and that of like you know going through and pulling out parts that don't quite fit until you get this kind of compressed distilled really flavorful result I think um it takes takes some some work so yes there was a there was a lot um and also we were we we, we recognized that um, as immersive as this is, um, people have a kind of, um, you know, you can't stay inside of a story too long. You know, we wanted people to kind of come up for air. So for instance, in Joelle's story, the, the first story that we played, Ian and I had a piece, a part in there where, so I, I, I'm interviewing Joelle. We go into the, the tea stop, the tea station, I think it was the Back Bay <laughs> station, and I'm interviewing him about what, what it's like as he hears the, the announcements and people moving around. And in the midst of that, uh, uh, an MBTA officer comes up to me and him and, and asks politely what we're doing. And I, I, I tell him, you You're know, very uh, gracious we're working on a, a piece for the Museum of Science. I'm uh, very gracious. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, I knew I was being recorded. And so, um, so I, you know, I, I, I explained it to him and he says, well, you know, you finish up, but, uh, but you're going to need to clear out. So, and then I asked Joel to reflect on that. What was that like? What were you mm -hmm. feeling? What were you sensing? What, um, we initially had that in there it was an extra minute. And when we realized we needed to bring the piece down, we, we took that out. Yeah. There is one vestigial remain from that scene though, Ian, that you left in, which is the sound <laughs> of the, the, the back bay station door mm -hmm. opening that squeaky sound, which yep. I love. Um, so that that's the only remnant. That's your little that. reminder. So yes, there are, yeah, that, that's right. That I need to that I need to honor the MBTA. That was a hard more. cut. I, I was sad to lose that bit. I, I will also say, so, James. So there are, yeah. 
I was going to say, James, for what it's worth, you know, when Ari said that he was, you know, working for the Museum of Science, that 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 pretty much patched things up with the MBTA officer. So <laughs> um, if you're ever in a tight spot. Yes, I'll show my badge. Yeah, um, show your badge. Yeah, I actually, I'm very happy that you shared that, Ari. I was hoping you would because I loved that part of the story too. And it was so sad to, I remember when you... <laughs> We had to cut it, but it totally made sense too. Um, so I, we had a great comment from uh, Jesse Nicole, who just had um, some really great insights to the experience. I will make sure to, to share with, with both Ari and Ian, so thank you. But they also had a great uh, question. I think it's a great place to, to end tonight on. Um, first, they were sad that they missed Joelle Salinas when they were at the Museum for the Talk. I can tell you to just keep an eye out on our programming. Um, we hope to have Joelle back for a future program for sure. Um, but they're, they're really wondering, do we have any specific ideas for the next live show without getting too specific? And as one of the producers, I'm going to say, we can't give too much away, but uh, is there any sort of hint or, or sort of preview that the two of you can give us about the new show? Uh, it is, it is underway. Uh, we are, um, you know, we're, 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 talking with James about it kind of exactly when and how we present it, but we're hoping it'll be, you know, sometime later this year in the fall. Um, and uh, we're, we're thinking of kind of a similar format, probably four stories. Mm -hmm. um, we've recorded tape for the first two, which um, are, are, I think they're, they're, they're fun. They're very different than the four you've heard tonight. And we've got a third uh, that uh, we still, we, we've got lined up and we've got to do an interview for. And the fourth is still open. So yeah. should you have something? You have an, like an immersive um, first person story that you want to hear sculpted. And that you want Ian to score. <laughs> Maybe that, that could be like yeah, a prize. We, would, we, we should we, have like we a raffle love... or something. Raffle yeah, they could win one of your a... knitted masks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if anybody wants. That, um, but, but yes, we'll be we'll be announcing. James will be announcing that with his fall lineup, and um, we'll be putting a link up later where you can subscribe to a list. Yeah. And um, actually, we'll be sending an email out after after this, where if you want to sign up for future yeah. notifications about this program, we'll let you know. This batch of stories also takes us even further afield, I would say, and sort of the the scope of where they're going, where they're taking us. So, stay tuned. True. So with that, I think we're going to end tonight's program. Um, and, uh, you know, there are tons of links here. If you're interested in checking out my work or Ian's work, you know, I'll also plug another group that I'm involved with called Story Collider, um, where we produce uh, live shows where we get scientists and non-scientists up on stage to tell true personal stories. Um, from their lives. Um, we are um, in a hiatus from the live show period right now um, until it's safe to resume gathering, but we're doing a bunch of virtual shows, including our 10th anniversary show, which is coming up in just a couple weeks, and you can find out more about that at storycollider.org. Um, I should also mention that I do a lot of work for Nova as a, a video producer, digital video producer for them. Um, you should check out the Nova website. We've got a broadcast, a film, on, uh, on the coronavirus called Decoding COVID-19 that's airing Wednesday night, May 20th. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, we've got this link at the bottom of this slide here where if you wanna sign up for future um, you know, notifications, uh, please type in that uh, gobbledygook or you can wait our email, which will be coming down the pipe shortly. Awesome. Yeah, so, so thank you all so much for coming. Ian? Oh, was I supposed to give a plug for myself? If you'd like. Oh, okay. Oh, well, yeah. You can, you can check out my website. Also, well, I guess if you were looking for other um, immersive experiential content that takes you into unexpected worlds, you can check out uh, my current podcast project is a show about what it's like to be a long haul trucker. And it's called Over the Road. So search for that in any of your podcast apps and you can hear more of what I've been up to. Thank you both Ari and Ian for tonight. Uh, we can't wait to have you back at the museum and for this next show. Thank you to everyone out there for spending your Wednesday night with us. If you enjoyed yourselves, you can check out the rest of our, our virtual season by going to that website that's listed on your screen, mos.org slash adults. 
we have some fantastic stuff still to come. And I want to thank our friends from the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible. And once again, if you enjoyed yourself and you can, please go to mos.org slash science matters and show your support for the uh, MOS at home initiative and allow us to keep bringing programming like this into your home during this kind of isolation. Thank you once again. Have a great night.